Welcome to CityWorks, a production of the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies and CUNY TV. I'm Laura Flanders. Every month here at CityWorks, we explore the challenges and lived experiences of working people on the job, at home, and in our communities. On today's program, we discuss some remarkable transformations in the labor market that are reimagining the way people work and earn a living. Case in point, college sports, where, thanks to recent rule changes, student athletes, the workers, can now monetize their personal brand by endorsing products and making deals with companies to use their name, image, and likeness. The NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, is arguing in court that college athletes should be considered employees of their schools, a move that could potentially revolutionize the world of college sports. We'll explore that in more detail in the second half of our program today, but we begin with the gig economy, specifically the ride-hail company Uber with its million and a half drivers across the U.S., a symbol of not only the changing face of work, but also the growth of precarious, low-wage, platform-based gig work. Uber's rise has been far from peaceful. Under the banner of disruption, the company's displaced traditional taxi cabs and conquered markets by violating labor law and other regulations with impunity. Kafui Ato, an associate professor at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, or SLU, and Katie Wells, a postdoctoral fellow at Georgetown University, have studied and written about how Uber overcame early resistance to its operations in Washington, D.C., and how that became a victory that provided a model for the company's conquest of other cities around the globe. Their book, co-authored with Declan Cullen, is called Disrupting DC, The Rise of Uber and the Fall of the City. Kafui Ato and Katie Wells, welcome both to CityWorks. I'm glad to have you. Thanks, great to be here. So we don't have anybody from Uber right here, right now, but I would imagine, reading, having read your book, that some of them might say, disrupting DC, we didn't disrupt it, we came in and we solved a whole range of its problems. How would you respond, Kafui? Um, I think there's a, there's a common dictum associated with um, Silicon Valley um, move fast and break things, often attributed to Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and to some degree, I think, um, when Uber entered DC, they realized that the city was already broke. You know, there was already issues there. Uber didn't make those issues any better. That's what we argue in the book. And in fact, it deepened the kind of inequalities and injustices that it proposed to, to solve. But the justices were not real. I mean, they said, I mean, there was racism in terms of who would get a, be able to get a ride from the hail cabs companies. Um, there was dysfunction of the public transport, the metro system. There was lack of flexibility, perhaps, in the workplace. Yeah, all these are real issues. <laughs> I mean, they, and that's the kind of tension in the book, which is these, these are real problems that cities face. Um, Part of what we try to say is that, you know, there are other options, you know, that the, the fact that cities must turn to a for-profit company that ultimately has the impact of lowering labor standards, um, you know, is a, is a symptom of a set of lowered expectations about what we expect from cities. Um, so I think so in, in one hand, yes, there are issues that Uber has sought to address, but um, you know, that says more about our f collective failure um, in you know, public, the public sector's pu public, uh, collective failure in addressing them. Katie, coming to you in DC, what was Operation Rolling Thunder? Yeah, the Operation Rolling Thunder, right, which uses a terrible name from the military bombing in Vietnam, um, was an attempt, a new kind of lobbying attempt that Uber unveiled in 2012 to convince the city council to eliminate any kind of labor or wage protections for taxi workers, as well as two other key things. One was a requirement that Uber's fleet would become accessible for the disabled rider community. And two is that those operations would be visible to regulators. And Uber won all three. 
by asking anyone who had ever downloaded the app to text and tweet and email their council members um, to say, please don't regulate this entity. And it worked beautifully. The Washington Post called it a rider revolt. Mm. But for us, it was sort of a new kind of, I think, political citizenship um, that was based in consumerism. You articulate that very clearly in the book. And Katie, sticking with you, can you just explain what you mean when you write, one of you writes anyway, that Uber offered a different vision of the public realm? What do you yeah, mean? Yeah, Uber's vision of public life, right, as we try to show throughout this book, was really based on a very narrow set of expectations. These are really narrow ideas about regulation. You can think it's very similar actually to MAGA ideas about you know common rules as this antiquated thing. These are ideas about racial justice that are based only in a very narrow idea about consumer access. These are also ideas about data and automation, and most importantly, right, for your audience, um, really narrow set of ideas about labor rights. How so? You want to build on that, Kafui? A lot of the drivers we interviewed, you know, you know, had all sorts of complaints about Uber and the working conditions that they faced. Um, there were issues that I think have to do with, um, you know, lack of transparency, um, people being uh, kicked off the platform without any explanation. The issue, though, that we found is that a lot of these drivers, you know, faced similar kind of conditions in the kind of regular workforce that in comparison to working at, say, you know, Walmart or Fuddruckers or any other kind of service sector job, that it, you know, as bad as Uber was, it, it was rather similar to working in these other, other, um, other industries. So I, I think that's kind of what we, you know, it, it, it's bad, but there's, you know, they're responding to kind of terrible conditions in the, the, the regular workforce as well. So that goes back, Katie, to this whole question of lowered expectations. I mean, you have a beautiful part towards the end of the book where you speak to a woman who's a driver who is overwhelmed. She's working a gazillion jobs. She's trying to make a living. She is, I think, a woman of color. She finds an Uber a way to make ends meet. And you ask, but how else could her problems have been resolved? And I think to me that gets to the heart of it. When you, for example, talk about racism as a problem for drivers in the workplace, for passengers trying to hail a car, um, what would be the non-Uber solution? Uh, Uber comes in and says, just leave it to us. We'll provide alternatives. You say that's not good enough. Yeah, but it's understandable, right? Like they get at a real problem. And I'll share a moment that really stuck with me from this research that I think gets at this question, right? So the DC council was very much aware of the racism inherent in the taxi industry. And when Uber came to town, they saw it as a way to address that. Right. But there was one city council member who you may know the name of, Marion Barry, who had been a four-time mayor, who, who wasn't so sure about Uber. And the reason was, he asked, is how is it that less regulation is going to address this issue of discrimination? And I think that, that in that question, we get the answer, right, of what would have happened. Well, DC would have confronted this issue of racism in the taxi industry and a host of other issues, but it would have imagined a solution that didn't involve a form profit third party entity to come in and solve it. And that, again, is sort of an argument in, in asking that question of what would need to happen so that um, the driver you mentioned didn't need to rely on Uber. It would mean having public infrastructure that builds a kind of life in which Uber is not for her last end resort. Yeah. We're going to come back in just a second to this, but I want to raise what's happening in New York. Um, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance right now, headed by Baravid Desai, is up in arms in this city about a decision at the city level to open licenses to anyone who wants to be driving an electric vehicle for one of these companies. Part of the idea is to green the taxi fleet. But as far as the taxi drivers are concerned, this is a way to undercut their hard-earned role in the New York City economy. Here are a couple of the drivers. We are here today to tell the city, TLC, Uber and Lyft, that we need some respect 
as drivers. That we are not just numbers that you can replace as you feel like. We have families. We have kids to feed. We have people to take care of. And we rely on this job to take care of our families. The city, as citizens of this country, or as residents of the city, we need the city to protect us against these police companies and against these unlawful TLC rules. Hi, my name is Ibrahim Zuri. I'm a member of NYTWA, also work for Lyft. My take on TLC new plan to flood the street of New York would end up in so much competition that none of us is going to be making money to pay for this car loan that we are going to engage in. MTA will not allow anyone to come to the street of New York with buses to do the same job that they are doing because they protecting and regulating their industry so their worker could retire with good pension and benefit. In our industry, we don't have none of that. MTA there, the Metropolitan Transport Association that runs the buses and the subway system, the um, TLC, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, the New York City organization that deals with the regulation of the taxi industry. Kafwi, listening to these folks, what do you think? It, it reminds me of, you know, the, the experience in 2015, 2016 with the wave of uh, taxi driver suicides that, um, you know, were in response to the the kind of um, devaluation of the medallion with the flood of Uber and Lyft and, and I, I think... The it, medallion being that thing that the taxi drivers put so much money and work yeah. into earning so that they have a place in the fleet. Right, and the lives and dignity of the incumbent drivers. Um, it, 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 you'd, you'd hope that public policy would focus as much on, you know, the, the condition of workers as it is on, you know, the convenience of of consumers. But Katie, the, the city is saying, you know, this is our way to green the fleet. Let's have more electric vehicles. Yes, but we have to keep in mind, right, that this is a game that Uber has played over and over for the last decade. And many countries across the world have not been so willing to get in bed with this company. And even New York State itself, right, recently settled its largest wage, wage theft case. Um, against Uber and Lyft for a combined $328 million, right? Because we know these companies do not play by the rules. So to continue the conversation about the rules and, and, and the argument in your book, one of the things that I took away from reading it was that there is a kind of discourse of modernity. It's like maybe Marion Barry's way, four-time mayor years ago, was the old way of regulation and government. This is the new way. You're solving your problems. Get over it. And then with the added twist that you mentioned, the autonomous vehicle discourse, which has everybody afraid of losing any role in picking, in driving cabs. Um, how does that change the story? And that was one of the things that hit us, right, is there is this automation discourse circulating. We don't see automated vehicles here yet, right? Not m many of them. What we do hear is constant talk from workers, the 40 workers we followed for five years as part of this study, and the 30 local policymakers that we followed from that same period, right? They constantly talked about automation as this thing that was coming. And it almost arrived in a way that allowed them to believe that they shouldn't address the current issues, right? For workers, it meant why work to sort of unionize the engine room of the Titanic as it sinks? These jobs will become obsolete. Why work to improve it? For policymakers, why deal with questions about paratransit or equity when, you know, automated vehicles are going to come and solve everything for us? And so it became this powerful disabling discourse where it allowed the future to sort of push aside the messy reality of right now. So what do you recommend people do right now? I mean, obviously in New York, there's people protesting. They've been successful in the past. The Taxi Workers Alliance is a feisty and well-organized and determined group. Um, but you do argue that there are some new political spaces that need to be staked out by organizers. And I'm assuming that includes the trade union movement, Kafui. Yeah, absolutely. I think that what the New York uh, Taxi Workers Alliance has been doing is um, absolutely necessary and, 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 and important. There are other, um, there's a new 
uh, drivers co-op operating in New York that I think is, is, is very promising. I think uh, turning attention to the kind of gaps in the social safety net that we kind of outline in the book, whether it's um, um, you know, low-waged work, which is why a lot of people turn to Uber, whether it's um, you know, inadequate public transit, why people, again, addressing those kind of broader structural issues is important. And that means building links between uh, the trade union movement, groups like the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, and people working at those kind of um, structural levels in terms of public policy. Seeing those as all connected, I think, is, is, what, is, is what is needed. Anything you'd add to that, Katie? Yeah, this is not, it, 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 while it addresses structural issues, right, this is an easy policy fix. Other <laughs> places have done it, and we can do it too. Well, thank you, Kafui Atto and Katie Wells. Wonderful speaking with you both. We'll take a short break and return with the new era for college athletics. Student athletes are now being paid. You're watching CityWorks. This is CityWorks. The college sports landscape is rapidly changing. Student athletes have new rights and privileges that were unthinkable for prior generations of players. Most notably, athletes are now able to profit off their name, image and likeness while retaining their college eligibility. The NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, wants college athletes to be considered employees which could carry much broader implications across college sports, including the right of college athletes to form and join, you guessed it, labor unions. Cameron Black has studied the rapidly transforming world of college athletics through the lens of labor and management and the history of capital. He's an assistant professor of labor studies at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, or SLU. Welcome to CityWorks. Let's talk about college sports and um, student athletes. What did they win that makes this generation so different? Uh, this generation is sort of rapidly transforming. And I, uh, to say rapidly transforming is an understatement. <laughs> uh, they, they've won several key legal decisions that actually sort of allow for them to profit off of what we call name image likeness, so NIL. So they can uh, get contracts. So they can, sponsorship kind of contracts? Yes, yeah, so they can negotiate different contracts with outside organizations um, based off of their name, image, and likeness. And this is sort of really, really transformative because in prior generations, of course, uh, acad st student athletes were only eligible for um, scholarship aid that was directly tied to educational benefits. Got it. So they couldn't go, I mean, that was the real distinction between other athletes and college athletes, that they were getting college aid, that was all they were able to get, and even if they became super famous, they couldn't really profit off that. No, and I, I would actually go to stipulate that it actually makes student athletes a very unique sort of brand of worker, as they're some of the only sort of workers that are slotted into almost an amateur framework without the ability to leave the framework while they're inside of it to make money in any other ways. So a particularly interesting kind of example, like if you're, if you're an apprentice in, uh, for a trade, you can still theoretically have outside employment to right. make you some, some kind of money. For, for a long time, student athletes could not do this. Right. Um, they would be automatically ruled as ineligible. Okay, so when this verdict came down and this change happened, all their problems went away? No. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately not. I, I wish it was the case. But NIL has sort of created some new, uh, very interesting and, and challenging problems. So while that's name, identity, likeness. Yes, Got name, it. image, and likeness. It, image. Image. Right. Uh, but identity can also be folded into that as well. Um, I, I'd sort of call it that um, th these 
reforms sort of place the protections of student athletes now into the hands of the market, quote unquote. Well, we know where that can go or not go. <laughs> we, we know where it can go, <laughs> not go, and, and, and dare not tread to go. Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of protections that student athletes might try to, might, might sort of argue for, are sort of now thought of in the hands of capitalist processes. The market, and, like the rest of our society, is typically very raced and gendered and classed. Um, how has this played out for college athletes so far of different races and genders? Uh, gender, I think, is a particularly salient um, sort of lo like line. Uh, as a lot of, uh, as NIL uh, agreements sort of prioritize people who can make their corporations more money in these different ways. So male athletes, particularly male football players with star basketball players as well, have exceedingly large NIL contracts where female athletes have correspondingly less. Con uh, a uh, particularly, I guess, salient example was in 2022 for a period, for a, a roughly uh, five, six week span, um, the, the leading quarterback at, at the University of Alabama made more in NIL than almost every single female athlete in the state combined. Well, isn't that just the market at work? That is the market at work. And I, I, I would argue that that can be quite troublesome when you're looking for issues of equity or um, equality. The, the market, as, uh, as uh, the, the leading conservative thinker, uh, Frederick von Hayek, might say, is free, but it is certainly not fair. So we might want to think more closely about how we're going to regulate these different processes. So that brings us to today. Where do things stand? You said there were several balls in the air around these questions. So there, there are, um, I, I would like to at least highlight, I guess, one sort of floating one, um, that's House versus NC, the NCAA. Um, and this case, it's still sort of being decided and, and, and worked on, has the potential to really radically transform uh, student athletes, as um, in this particular case, House actually is trying to claim that student athletes should be thought of as an entire class of people um, and not simply thought of as just individual student athletes. And that's huge. And what would that mean? We heard in the introduction something about they could form unions? Yes, and they, that, that's actually exactly how they could form labor unions or join unions. As uh, unionization efforts are generally focused around classes of people, uh, you need to have a, a, a substantial amount of, uh, of vested interests mm. um, or, or collective vested interests to, to form unions. And historically, student athletes were never regarded as a unique class of people. So they could never, not, not only could they not form their own unions, they could not join other labor unions. So House, the House versus NCAA threatens to, up, to sort of transform that arrangement. And this could lead to even f more far, uh, far reaching questions. That's the name of the lawsuit. You mentioned history and you mentioned sort of um, collectivity. And I was reminded of your research uh, going back into the 60s that had to do with a sense of solidarity and activism among athletes. Can you talk a little bit about that period and this one? How do they compare, contrast, and is there a sense of solidarity among the student athletes that you're talking to today? Um, so the 1960s, as uh, I'm sure we're all aware, was an incredibly turbulent time, and student athletes were not exempted from this. Um, so uh, this was in an era of more rapid integration uh, of different races. Black athletes are, inc are, are increasingly becoming um, more and more dominant in, in, in the sport, um, different poor students um, from different regions of the United States are, are, are beginning to integrate into um, what was traditionally sort of an elite, sort of top-down sort of sport. And the 60s was really a explosive time for all of these arrangements. So uh, forming different type of alliances was actually kind of critical uh, for black athletes in particular. Black athletes sort of found their own type of solidarity amongst each other, but also amongst different, uh, both civil rights um, activists and black power activists. And do we see that 
today, particularly among these student athletes. We see it among some athletes, been very active around things like the Black Lives Matter movement and so on. I, I think we do. And, and, and in fact, I think we actually see a broader sort of more interracial coalition than what we did in the 1960s. In fact, universities in the 60s actually used race to sort of separate particular at the, these uh, uh, groups of people to stop them from actually coalescing to argue for rights. In, in 2023, that's very different. Uh, we're seeing a much more sort of interracial and intra, intrasex uh, coalition. Um, in, in this most recent case, House versus NCAA, uh, we have actually uh, two male athletes and one female athlete mm -hmm. actually suing. Thank you, Cameron Black. It's great, been great talking to you. Thank you so much. That's it for CityWorks this time. If you have comments or questions, write to us at cityworks at slu.cuny.edu. For CityWorks, I'm Laura Flanders. Thanks for watching.